gym this past week. Um, I like to work out and not think about how hard I'm working out, so I was listening to a podcast by Pastor Andy Stanley, and he was preaching on the importance of investing in the lives of people younger than you. You know, it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in, everyone here has someone that they know that's younger than themselves. And so it's very important um, for us, because uh, I, I see the high school students back here, and it's important for you guys too, to take the gifts that God has given you, the experiences God has given you, the unique story that God has given you, and invest it in the life of someone younger. Share your wisdom. Share what God has done for you. And he said something in the midst of this sermon that I think applies to the series we've been in on generosity. And what he said was, um, he was reflecting on the death of his mentor, who passed away actually just last year. And as he thought about the death of his mentor, and he thought about all the funerals he's officiated in his lifetime, and all the funerals he's attended, he concluded this, that when we gather to celebrate the life of someone who's gone home to be with the Lord, the thing we place the most value on is not how much that person accumulated in his or her lifetime, but how much that person gave away. How much of their time, how much of their energy, how much of their care, how much of their love, how much of their resources did they give and invest in the life of someone else and invest in God's kingdom? That's the thing we hold up. And as I thought about this and, and what it says about generosity, I also recognize that, you know, there's an uncomfortable thing about generosity. It costs us something. It's sacrificial. Now, you guys understand what I mean. If a millionaire were to give $1,000 to a charity, would we consider that generous? Uh, you guys are so quiet. <laughs> don't know what to say because you don't want to say the wrong thing. But we might not consider that generous um, because maybe it didn't cost him or her anything. It was pocket change. But say a single mom on minimum wage gave $1,000 to that same charity. Would we consider that generous? Yes. And so the idea that generosity costs us something is pretty much in conflict with the message that we are being told all the time by our society, which is basically more and better. You want to get more, get better. Um, buy more, save more, keep more for yourself and for your family because in these things, that's where your happiness lies. That's where your self-worth lies. That's where your security lies, right? No, okay. You with me, okay? Um, but that's what we're constantly being told. That if we only have this next thing, our life will be fulfilled. Or there's something wrong with us if, if we don't want that. And they've come up with a term for this in the last couple decades called affluenza. And yeah, you guys have heard it in the news recently. And PBS defines affluenza as this bloated, sluggish, unfulfilled feeling that results from efforts to keep up with the Joneses. And so I think that something changes in us when we're forced to look at our lives in the light of eternity. It makes us reevaluate what really matters, and it helps us to reprioritize our lives and distinguish what is valuable and what is lasting from what is temporary and untrustworthy. But you know what? I don't think we need to wait for a funeral to do that. I think our faith in Jesus Christ calls us to do that on an everyday basis. Jesus said, heaven and earth, okay, all of this stuff that we see, all this stuff that we can buy, heaven and earth, all that's going to pass away. But my kingdom's not going to pass away. And it's that same Jesus who says, follow me. And then gives us the example of what it looks like to be ex exceedingly, abundantly generous in giving his life. And so at the end of the day, how, much, how many of us want to have lived a generous life? Yeah, I, I would think most of us, probably. 
And I also think that on a day-to-day -day basis, most of us want to be generous. I have never met anyone who said, hey, I want to be stingy today. It just, it doesn't happen. We've all got really great intentions. But somehow, sometimes our good intentions don't always get translated into action. And I want to use a, actually a Memorial Day story to illustrate why I think this is. Um, when I was a teenager, my mom and my sisters and I, we got invited to a Memorial Day cookout. And my mom, she was an ER nurse, so it's not necessarily a holiday for doctors and nurses and um, our police force and all the essential workers, so she had to go to work in the morning. But because she's my mom, and this is just how she's always been, she really wanted to bring something to this party. And she wasn't asked to, but she decided she was going to make deviled eggs. So, someone's hungry. Yeah. I know, me too. Um, th that makes it worse, doesn't it? Um, but she made them the night before because she had to work that day. And so she made them the night before, she put them in the fridge, she left for work that morning. My sister and I were home alone. Um, do I really need to say anything else? <laughs> Uh, we were home by ourselves, high school students, no school, kind of lazy, didn't really feel like cooking anything. And these were just, I mean, these gorgeous eggs um, were just sitting in the fridge, no, no label on them. They weren't like set aside. They were just in there with all the other food, okay? Um, so what I want to be clear, though, is that my sister started it. It wasn't me. She's not here to defend herself, but she might see this online. Anyway, it was her, she started it. And so well, by the time my mom got home, it was about time to head out to the cookout. And so she quick changed her clothes and went to grab the eggs out of the fridge. And when she looked down at the tray, inside the tray were, you know, the little, like, divots are, were these. Um, and I heard her yell my name and my sister's name. And we'd, like stayed upstairs, <laughs> didn't come down. And, and you know what, now we can laugh about it, but it, it took a little while. <laughs> we couldn't laugh about it then. Because what we had done was we had cut down on her contribution. We had diminished what she had planned to bring and offer to this party. And so she was not very happy. And I just told her, I said, Mom, you should be glad you didn't have boys. Be <laughs> Those of you who have boys, no. If, you know, if you had had boys, there wouldn't be any eggs left. And there wouldn't be an apology either. So anyway, I think that that's really just kind of an illustration of what tends to happen to all of us. A lot of times we have great intentions. We want to be generous. But if we're not careful to set apart whatever it is we hope to give, whether it's our time, our money, our energy, whatever it is, it tends to get eaten up by other things, right? I'm sure you all know this. I mean, if you, if you have kids, I mean, they run into all kinds of things that you end up needing that you weren't expecting. Or, I mean, how many of us have been in an accident or had something break at a really inconvenient time? Anything unexpected. These things are real needs. And a lot of times, if we've not been careful to set apart whatever it was we wanted to be generous with, we end up giving what's left over. And so I think, and I've been challenged to think about this too, I'll, a lot of times, that's also how we end up giving to God. It's not that we don't want to give to God, but there are these other things that come along. Can I get an amen, these other things? Yeah. And I think we can learn a lot about generosity toward God from our ancestors in the Old Testament. Because if we look at um, back into the Old Testament and see what our ancestors in the faith did, their primary way of worshiping God was not by singing songs. It wasn't by listening to sermons. But what they would do was they would build an altar, and on that altar they would offer to God the fruit of their labors. Not, not what was left over, but they would bring the first and the very best of what they had, whether it was their flocks, they would bring the first animal born in their flock for that year, first animal without blemish. Or if they were, um, if, if they were farmers, they would bring the first yield of crops for that harvest season. And they would sacrifice them there to God. They would burn them there on that altar. That's where we get the concept of first fruits. It was the very first fruit of their labor that they would bring. 
And it said in the, in the Old Testament that the smell of these offerings, in fact, it, Leviticus mentions it 16 times, the smell of these offerings was pleasing to the Lord. But do you guys honestly think that God likes the smell of burnt meat and grain? I really? I don't think so. That's not what was pleasing to God. What was pleasing to God was what these things represented. It was the heart behind what was given. Because when we sacrifice something, we're giving up something of value for something or someone else that we deem to be of even greater value or of even greater worth. How many of you have ever given something up for someone you love? Yeah, because whatever that thing was, it paled in comparison to the way that you value that person and the worth that you ascribe to that person in your life. And so by sacrificing to God the first and the very best of what they have, it was a symbolic way of saying, God, you mean more to me than all these things. I love you more than I love my stuff. I trust you more than I trust in my stuff. And so if they had given God what was left over at the end of the harvest season, would that have expressed the same gratitude, the same devotion? No. It wouldn't have cost them anything. And so God, it it would have been like treating God as an afterthought. And so when we think about the word sacrifice, and it's a word we talk about a lot, there's another word that's kind of hidden in that, that word sacrifice. And does anyone know what that is? Sacred, yeah. Sacred, holy. And if something is holy, if something is sacred, what that means really is just that it's set apart. It's set apart for God and for God's purposes. And so a gift that pleases God is one that we have set apart and said, God, use this as you would. Take this and do with it what you will. And so I'm not saying that we should build an altar right here and start bringing livestock and start bringing produce in and start burning it here. Um, And really that's selfish because as a pastor of worship, I don't want to have to be responsible for cleaning it up. Um, But really, theologically, the reason that we don't do that is because Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. And so God doesn't ask us for those things any longer. But even after thousands of years, we still come and we still worship God. And what God's looking for when we worship is the exact same thing that God was looking for back in the Old Testament. What God's wanted all along is us. God wants our hearts. God wants our lives. And so ultimately what God asks us to do and what we read in Romans is to bring ourselves before God as living sacrifices. Paul writes, So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, because of everything that God has done for you, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, because of those mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy, that's set apart and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. This is how you are to worship. And so when Paul was writing this letter, he talked about the body, but the body was representative of the whole self. And so really what we're hearing here is give yourselves to God. Let your whole self, heart, soul, mind, and strength be set apart for God and for God's purposes. Our songs, our gifts, our presence, our service, they don't mean anything to God unless we also give God our lives. And God wants to be first. God is a jealous God. God wants to be first in our lives. Jesus said, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guys, this is hard, right? I don't know about you, but there are so many other things out there that, that grab for our attention, that it, it, we're tempted to strive for before we strive for God and God's kingdom. And what are some of those things? Some of those things that we're tempted to run after. Money, fame, pleasure, what else? Power, stuff, 
security, happiness, whatever it is. We are tempted to run after all these things before we seek God's kingdom. And so when we end up doing that, when we fall into that trap, what ends up happening is that God ends up get, getting whatever of us is left over. You know, whatever parts of our time, whatever parts of our energy, whatever parts of our love, our resources, when we don't seek God's kingdom first, God gets the leftovers. But God's saying, I want all of you. I want your life. Now, if there's anything, anything worth going all in for, anything worth giving everything for, it's the kingdom of God. And that's what we heard about those parables in Matthew. There was a man who was walking through a field. We don't know what he was doing. He could have been a laborer for hire. He might have been plowing this field. And he stumbles across a treasure. And back then it would have been wrong for him to take the treasure from the field. So he put it back, buried it, and then he went away and he sold everything he had to come and buy that field. And that's what the kingdom of God is like. If there's anything worth giving it all for, it's God's kingdom. And so I want to tell you a story about, that I think is kind of an example of sacrificial giving at its best. Now, many of you know that I completed part of my uh, field education and seminary in Uganda. I spent three months teaching Bible and theology to middle and high school students. And as part of my time there in this three months, I also tutored. I tutored math and I tutored writing. And so I would have a couple students come to me um, in the afternoons each week, and one of those students' name was Kaima. And Kaima would come for help a couple of days every week for help, for help with geometry. And as we worked on geometry week after week, one day he brought his brother with him. And his brother's name was Juko. And that's the two of them. That's Kaima with a smile. Juko's shy. Uh, didn't want to smile for the camera, but that's the two of them, and Kaima I was teaching in my second year um, class of secondary school, and I hadn't met Juko, so I said, Juko, where are you in school? What year are you in? Um, and it turns out that Juko wasn't in school. He had dropped out after his first year of secondary school um, to work and to do odd jobs so that he could make sure that his brother went to school. And after this meeting that day, I went and I prayed. I prayed a lot um, because I really, I wanted to do something to help Kaima and Juko, but also it's not always as easy as it seems because I was teaching dozens of students who were in similar financial need. But God laid it on my heart to make sure that these two boys finished high school. And so I went to the headmaster and I made sure that Juko got re-enrolled and he started back as a second year student right with his brother. And about two weeks after this happened, both boys came knocking at my door. And so I opened my door, and I saw them standing there with eager smiles on their faces, and, and they invited me to their home. They said, we really want you to come to our house this weekend. And so they were so adamant, I made sure that my schedule was clear, and I went with them to their home. Folks, nothing could have prepared me for what I experienced when I got there. The first thing um, that I discovered when I got there was that these two boys lived alone. That they had been working on either side of the school day to make enough money to pay rent on this one-room house. And the second thing that I encountered when I was there was there was a pile of things. There was a hat made of palm fronds that they had made for me. There was a mat that they had gotten for me. There was sugar cane, there were pineapples, there were sodas that had been purchased at the local canteen, and there was a chicken. Um, that's the chicken. Um, that was dinner. And so they brought me to their house because they wanted to thank me, and they gave me this gift of this day with them that included not one, but two meals. I don't know if you guys have ever had a 14- and 16-year-old boy, boys cook for you, but it was, you know, I was really impressed and the thing was, they were so proud of this gift that they were giving. They had poured so much of their time, so much of their energy. They had emptied their savings to give me this gift, and they were so proud that they had me take pictures. They wanted me to remember it. And I think you guys will understand what I'm going to say, that it wasn't 
the gift that left the impression. The gift itself wasn't what was meaningful. It was what it cost them. I've eaten probably more than 30,000 meals, I was counting this morning, in my lifetime. Um, And in comparison to a lot of them, this would be considered pretty humble. But what I said, it's, it's not what it was. It was the sacrifice. It was so much of themselves represented in this gift. And so, as I thought about this, I thought about how this is really um, reflected in, in what Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, that it's not the gift, but it's what's behind the gift that's really important. And I just want to read that for you because we didn't read it today, but Jesus was teaching in the temple, and as he was sitting there teaching, um, he was in the outer court, and he looked up and he saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Her last two copper coins was what she put in. And so Jesus praises her. He doesn't lift up the size of her gift, but he lifts up her sacrifice. And in about 20 seconds, he takes our bigger is better mentality and he turns it on its head. In God's kingdom, the size of the gift is not the measure of generosity, but it's what it represents for the giver. And so for the rich people coming into the treasury, these large sums that they were putting in, To them, it was pocket change. It was leftovers. The widow, she put in everything she had. And so can you imagine how much gratitude, how much trust, how much love that represented for her? And so that brought me back to my experience with Kaima and Juko and just how much of their heart and soul was represented in their gift to me. And still, I just, I can't help but thinking how much pride they took in it. And I've thought about times when I've given gifts that I've been really proud to give, whether I've made it myself or I've gone to really great lengths um, to get something that I know someone's just, it's going to be the perfect thing for them. They're really going to love it. And I thought, and I'm sure you guys are probably thinking about times you've done that. Um, For me, recently, it was just as recent as this past Christmas. And as I thought about that, What really challenged me is that as Dan and I have been praying about um, the commitment we're going to make to God next week, as I'm sure many of you have been praying about that and thinking about that, what challenged me is that I can't remember the last time I felt that way about a gift I gave to God. And yet I say that God is the one who is first in my heart. And so I'm confessing to you that I am allowing God to work in me this week. I am taking that and wrestling with it and being prayerful about what does it look like for me to bring God a gift that I'm proud of? What does it mean to give God a gift that represents my best, my love, my life, my gratitude? And I know that some of you have already done that. And last week in worship, we celebrated the fact that we have already received 33 pledges in our Generous Together campaign I'm totaling just about one and a quarter million dollars. That's just under half our goal. And I'll tell you that that amount represents a lot of prayer. It represents a lot of sacrifice on the part of all the families who participated to this point. And while I was here at the church earlier this week, I actually ran into someone who had made an advanced commitment. I, I didn't know um, that she had made a commitment, but she had, and, and she wanted to tell me about it. Um, She's a single mom. She's got three kids, and she said, you know, out of those 33 people, I know who gave the least, and that was me. But I doubled what I've been giving. It's uncomfortable for me, she said. It's going to mean that we're going to sacrifice some of the things that we want. But you know what? I want to do that. I want to do that. And when we're free of this debt, she said, we'll be able to do even more ministry and touch even more lives to the kingdom of God. And it was in that that I heard her desire to seek God's kingdom, to 
put God's kingdom first. And what I heard what for her represented a step of faith. And so for those of us who um, have yet to give um, toward the campaign, or if you're visiting here and you're not even thinking about what we're going to be doing next week, that's okay. Anytime we think about offering our lives to God and what we bring to God, don't ever be tempted to think that your gift is insignificant because it's not insignificant to God. I think that's what Jesus is trying to show us in that encounter with the widow. Because when you bring God a gift with all your heart and all your soul behind it, it doesn't matter the number that's on that card. If it's a gift to God that says, God, your kingdom first, not my kingdom. If it's a gift that says, my life is yours, then that, that's going to please God. So friends, I know there are people out there who are really good at numbers, and we've kind of figured out what our goal is for this campaign um, and kind of where we need to go. I'm going to tell you, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it. Because I think if we seek God, if we are prayerful in bringing God something that honors God and that represents our life in our best, what did Jesus say? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you as well. God's going to take care of this. All of these things will be added unto you as well. Amen.